I need no presenter console. Okay. Hi. So, hope you're enjoying the conference thus far. We have Robert Rowley, aka Lay, with Detecting and Defending Against State Actor Surveillance. All right, uh, tackle, tackle. who is that? Damn it, shut up. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you all for showing up. Uh, yeah, again, this is Detecting and Defending Against State Actor Surveillance. My name is Robert and Orlay. Uh, you can go ahead and her get on Twitter right now to go ahead and start harassing me. Uh, who am I? Uh, you know, my name is Robert. Uh, I'm part of, like, you know, many, many groups out here. I'm a speaker. I'm kind of uh, apparently become an advocate of sorts for privacy stuff recently. Uh, my primary job is a researcher, security research. Uh, part of Irvine Underground, which is a group out of Irvine, California. We meet up every month. Uh, again, once again, I encourage people to harass me on Twitter. So this talk is going to be talking a lot about what happened with surveillance state, and there's been a lot of talk about privacy in the last year. So it breaks down for, for that. We start off with a little bit. Of, I start off with a little bit of an introduction. I explain some of the goals and the intents, and a little bit more details as to how you should view these sorts of uh, the information I'm going to be talking about. Then I can go right into the, what I call the sky mall leaks. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, I'm going to go over as much as I can explaining what they were, but they were released this last December in 2013. And then I'm going to give you my conclusions. With the sky mall leaks, I'm going to focus not on the entire breadth of what they were, but I'm going to talk about the hardware bugs, the software, in, uh, ma malware basically that they installed, some Wi-Fi attacks that they have, and some cellular network-based attacks. So to understand what's going on, we got to understand who's involved. It's pretty easy because this is all privacy and surveillance stuff. This is uh, it's all about those who spy and those that get spied on. You can choose which group you're part of, but I'm going to primarily focus on the concerns of those who are spied on because I'm going to detect and defend against those who are spying. But we have to take a minute to think about why do spies spy? Uh, information as value is a simple premise. Information can be used for good, it can be used for bad. There's morally good practices for information collection, uh, things like protecting people. You can protect people from harm. You can give them information that they need to, to you know, simply enough, if you know that there's going to be a missile strike at a certain location, the people, if they know that, are going to move from their location and no longer be affected, no longer be directly harmed. Uh, it can also progress society. If information is not held, I, I, I'm within that firm belief that if information is not withheld and contained and protected and given away freely, that we actually grow as a society in a better way, in a better way. There's also immoral values regarding spying on other people. You can use it as blackmail. You can use it against people. You can use it to try to coerce people into taking specific actions. You can also use it with profiteering. If you can steal intellectual property from other companies, use it in your business. Uh, there's an interesting triad and, or even more about conflict, really what happens at our US laws and even global laws. There's no country who's figured out the, the proper mixture of protecting an individual's privacy protecting a company's, company's uh, intellectual property and or copyright without, inf without them overlapping and starting to infringe in conflict with each other. And here in the US, we have the special happy thing of, of free speech, where we can always say, we can always try to claim free speech of, you know, whatever I'm saying about this person is free speech, but really it's not because it's conflict with that personal's, person's perhaps private actions, the right to be left alone, or a corporation's, uh, what they would call intellectual property, copyright trademark, things like that, and it's this funny conflict. Uh, it's something that I, I have with another talk that I talk about, but it's a personal interest of mine, but not what I'm going to talk about today. So full disclosure, I wanted to say I have, at least at one point in time in my life, probably more, uh, been under surveillance by the FBI. What's the question already? I don't. I submitted a FOIA request into which they said you have no record of you being under investigation by the FBI, to which I remember, I swear I remember, actually talking to the guy. <laughs> and I know his name. Uh, I also, to clarify too, I also loathe tinfoil hat wearers and or conspiracy theorists. If there is no hard factual evidence behind your story or endure your claim, I kind of really hate talking to you, so don't come up to me afterwards. Uh, if he's got an interesting story, I mean, obviously tell me, but if your story has no facts, facts or evidence or claims, anything besides just your crazy story, I'll probably sign you off as a person who wears a tinfoil hat. I forgot my cool tinfoil hat this time around. Um, but just uh, to give a quick explanation, uh, as to, it was about 10 years ago, not 12 years ago now, 2002 is when I was under investigation, apparently, by the FBI. I found out one day because I was sitting in my room, I was living with my grandma, 
uh, as any you know 18 year old hacker would and uh, I just hear my grandma call my name and I come up to the main you know living room there, there my grandma is with two guys in suits they both have guns and she says these guys are here to talk to you and I found out that you know my grandma actually she sat there everything the one thing she loved to do in life is play solitaire so I had actually gotten her a laptop with solitaire and you know basically windows and she could just play solitaire all day never had to shuffle her cards again and the FBI agents apparently had walked up started questioning her because her name was all on all of the internet accounts ISPs and so on and so forth they thought she was the target and she I don't know she did she did she did know uh, AT&T Unix before I was even born I found that out later as, as I was explaining it to her and she's like I know that I'm like wow uh, but she was really smart she was really good at optic apparently because she diverted all the attention to me to which I had to parade these these two agents around my house and they're like do you know so-and-so? Were you involved with this and this? And they're showing me screenshots and pictures, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. But they're like, can we see your, can we see your room, like your lab? I'm like, sure. And I go walk through my room. My lab, by the way, was in the garage, not in my room, but the access was through my bedroom. And they looked, pointed at my little Sony Vio laptop. And they're like, oh, is that your computer? Is that where you hack from? I'm like, no. I'm like, it's just my computer in my room. Let's go off to the garage. And I show them a garage, literally a two-car garage full of old VME servers, SGI workstations, to which these, both of these guys were, seemed a bit at awe and quite questionable. Uh, they looked over to my, uh, my Volkswagen Rabbit that I was driving with a free Kevin sticker on, and they kind of chuckled. And I'm like, shut up and let's look at the real shit. Uh, <laughs> later, I found out that that, because I memorized his name, because he had that much of an impact, this whole experience had a big impact on my life. But I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I later remember that that guy actually consulted for movies, various movies that uh, featured hackers and hacker dens. And he actually told me that he was the guy who would show the people like how to set up what a hacker den looked like. I'm like, motherfucker, that was my room. <laughs> I should have been getting that sweet, sweet like movie money. Anyways, that, that's just like my beginning. That's my story to get a little you know, full disclosure onto what, where, where I come from and why I'm talking why I do. Um, Getting into a proper story time, this didn't happen to me, but this is a good example of what I'm really looking for. In 2010, somebody was working on their car, and he found a GPS unit strapped to it, takes it out, unplugs it, takes it out, and a short while later, some law enforcement people show up to his house and say, you have something that's ours. This actually happened in LA. Uh, this is the only major story that I can recall in the last 10 years or so that actually showed physical evidence of a US citizen being spied upon would actually show what the physical evidence of the spying material was. And I value physical evidence more than anything else. Uh, and also, of course, since then, the feds deny any involvement in this. And they've kind of just, the whole story kind of subsides to nothing. I don't know if it was something that was manufactured by a journalist, but it was a good story. And at least they could show pictures of a physical, what looked like a GPS tracking unit back in 2010. Getting to what the surveillance guy mall leaks. These were uh, a series of leaks that were leaked in Der Spiegel and 30C3 in December 2013. You can go look up the talk. Uh, tons of details were given how these devices would work. So I'm going to kind of just quickly brush over how the devices were worked, would work, just so you can kind of get an idea. But that's a long, hour long talk where he explains, the individual explains exactly how they believe everything was working. Uh, the bugging computers, cell phones, everything imaginable. They imply a source, and they imply that the source appears to be Snowden leaks, and I've seen it re-referenced re as a Snowden related leak, but I actually couldn't find any credible sources that explain that it was from Snowden's leaks, which is important because knowing where the leak came from validates whether or not it's legitimate. And of course, any of these spying agents, no spying agency is going to say, yes, that was ours. Um, also, I should, before I get into it, because it's an implied leak and because the source is not really validated, in my opinion, most of this, and the reason why I gave this talk and most why I did all this research is mostly because I, I enjoy the thought experiment. I enjoy thinking about if there was a theoretical way to actually do spying in this manner, how would one defend or detect, more specifically, even better, detect that that spying and surveillance was taking place? And that's really what the focus of this talk is. Uh, starting off, these are a series of hardware bugs. These are retro reflectors segments is what they were called. Uh, I apologize, I don't have my uh, presenter notes so I can't cheat here. But uh, from memory, <laughs> 
the uh, these various devices were called Surly Spawn, Loud Auto, Rage Master, Tawdry Yard. They would they would be little bugs that were embedded in in line to systems like your VGA cable or uh, your not your USB bus, your keyboard, directly embedded in your keyboard or your audio, like your microphone for your audio. And they would basically amplify the signals that were being sent. So your VGA sim signal, instead of using that old school 1970s Tempest system, they would just in put this little device in line with your VGA cable, typically on like the one of the, uh, one of the, the red, like typically the red line, the red color, the red signal. And it, they would have a, another system remotely that would listen for the RF signal sent from that small device and then basically reconstruct what was showing up on your monitor. Uh, albeit only one, the red signal was, was what was claimed to be used, but that's enough to get a, an image as to what's on your screen. At least a good idea. Uh, other things like your keyboard and stuff like that, same idea. They just basically put a bug in line that listens to the, the data being passed between your keyboard and your computer, and it just sends that data over the RF signals. There are some claims that, uh, that the, they would use a reflector, so they'd have to send a signal to the device for you to get the, the, the signal back from the device, although they don't go into any details. They don't explain how any of this works. So those are all simple claims. I'm gonna go into how to detect radio frequency weirdness later, but all of these devices had a similar fact that, uh, well, well, all these devices are physical devices, but going back to the RF stuff, how would you protect the RF stuff? It's just You should all just tinfoil your room, right? Put everything in a Faraday cage. Nothing will get out and, uh, I'll remind you that that's not the point of this talk. <laughs> the point of the talk is not how to explicitly defend and or give you a magic bullet like a rock that will prevent tiger attacks or a snake oil sales pitch that will magically make things not happen. This talk is actually about knowing you were being targeted by a source. Doing hardware bugs that are sending RF signals over your, in, through your room to a, to a, a foreign place, you're gonna wanna use something like software-defined radio of which the, um, one of the more popular releases, the HackRF board, where uh, you basically program software programmatically, uh, tell this device to listen in on as many, as much of the spectrum, RF spectrum as you can, and you can listen in on it. Let's say you have a keyboard that you believe is bugged, or, or you know is bugged, hopefully you know it's bugged, and, uh, and you wanna be able to find out that any data is being sent off. You would simply enough, power off that device or not plug in your keyboard or your mouse or whatever it is and listen to your RF spectrum in your room and wait. Power on the device and if now you suddenly see an RF spectrum spikes, if there's data being sent over the RF spectrum that you don't, you can't physically see it, but now your software defined radio is telling you, yes, thing is, things are going off that weren't going off when the device was off, now you know that there's something physically there. You can actually probably be smart and crack open the device and look for something that doesn't belong. Going into a little bit more, hardware bugs for data exfiltration. Uh, what they reported was the cotton mouth, which is one, two, and three. These were all related to USB bus attacks. They would be a little device that they put input in line on your USB bus, either in the cable, on the USB headers, or in the USB chip in your, in your motherboard. The Ginsu was entertaining. That was a, this isn't actually a picture of it. This is a picture of a Wi-Fi card with a Ginsu knife that I made. Uh, the Ginsu was just basically, it, it attached to your Wi-Fi card and it would, again, it would, and strangely enough, it would interject in your Wi-Fi card and theoretically send out RF signals as to what your Wi-Fi card was sending out, even though probably that's what your Wi-Fi card is designed to do. Your, then there's Howler Monkey and Firewalk, which, again, they just simply targeted different things, either, you know, your Firewire or your directly on your motherboard, and they would just get in line with the bus on your hardware, listen to the data that's unencrypted at that level and send it over the f radio frequencies to be sent back to a central collecting device. Again, these are all theoretical things and I'm just glazing over them quickly to explain how they would work and how you would find them. Skipped over that. Um, again, all those as well, those are all RF based, so you would use the exact same RF, hack RF board or software defined radio to detect them. Uh, a another one, continuing on, Take a quick break for my milk. The, uh, another way for that uh, for these attacks is a series of attacks. These are persistent compromise attacks. We have all seen these in the hacker, basically in the security community-wise. These are all related to hacking your motherboard BIOS or malware on the low level, the boot sectors in your hardware. That's what these things would do. Uh, God Surge was a JTAG component that would actually hack your device every time it got rebooted. If it found that things were 
basically change it would it would uh, basically if it found that it got removed it would install itself again because it get, could access directly in your JTAG level or basically your JTAG headers or similar for your device. Uh, they all have different names: Headwater, Halix Water, School Montana, Sierra Montana, Jet Plow, Feed Through, Gourmet Through, Sofa Through. Um, they simply all basically did the same thing. These are devices that were physically connected to a device. Um, so it would be a small device that would connect to your motherboard or your, your main board, and then it would detect if, it had, if its malware had been removed and it would reinstall itself. So detecting a persistent compromised device, like a device that's physically connected to your computer and sits there and constantly reinstalls itself. Um, you want, need to know what a JTAG header is. Anybody here not familiar? Everybody here is familiar with JTAG? No? I see head shaking. Nobody wants to admit it, but they're quietly saying, I don't know what that is. JTAG headers are, they come in many different names. They can be called many different things with different motherboards. Basically, it's a low level direct access to your CPU. So, with a device for, with that has a JTAG device, you typically use these when you're hacking routers, and it's really uh, traditionally used primarily during a dev process for devi designing a, an embedded system. You plug into the JTAG headers, you get direct access to the CPU, so you can just basically feed it, um, you know, processes. <laughs> like here, we're just going to give you processes. You're going to write data to the to the firmware or and or the the, the I/O devices, and we're going to get you basically installed using JTAG things like that. You can also use this debugging in case anything goes wrong with your device, and it's like mm, very prominent in a firm like firmware devices. Mostly, you're going to see a lot of JTAG hacking stuff with Wi-Fi, uh, like Netgear routers, Wi-Fi routers, or just any just basic embedded device at home router system, you plug into the JTAG and that's the number one way to start hacking in the system. You give the CPU a response and basically say dump me your firmware and it will slowly process over this, basically JTAG's like a serial port, it's as fast as a fucking serial port, it'll just slowly dump you all the firmware data or you can push towards the device all the firmware data for it to dump onto its chips. Um, these exist in many different ways for many different systems, it can be called JTAG, XDP or whatnot. Uh, most people use them for Xbox hacking. Uh, you'll see JTAG uh, attached components to try to defeat the DRM style thing for Xboxes and other consoles because you get the CPU level access. Uh, again, this is exactly what the theoretical spy agencies were using. Yes, if you can plug directly into a JTAG header on a motherboard, you pretty much own the system as long as you have access to that, any way to communicate to that device, to that CPU, because that, well, that device has direct access to the CPU. What you're gonna see here on the left, or right, yeah, right from you guys, is a uh, is what a J uh, device that's plugged into a JTAG header would probably look like. And if anybody here believes that a device plugging into their computer that looks something like that is okay, you probably should rethink your your you know your your uh, line of work. Uh, if you go through a device and there's some weird fangled thing plugging into what you can identify as JTAG headers, it should not probably in all cases should never be there unless you put it there and you can take it off and see if somebody shows up at your door saying you have something that's ours. The basic idea, I can't show through every example of what these would look like on every different type of motherboard or router board or, or main board, but this picture is a good idea about how to detect it. The first person they could figure out what's wrong with that picture. It looks like it belongs. It looks like all the other chips, but it doesn't belong. That's the basic idea. With those, you have to actually have physically open up your computers and look at them. Uh, if you're not familiar, if you're not comfortable with doing that, you probably, again, shouldn't own a computer or be here. But <laughs> it's kind of our job to open up the computers and look at them to say, I did or did not find this weird device plugged into my JTAG headers. <laughs> Are you trying to flag me with a cookie? Um, that's the most important thing. and. Uh, I think you were leaving. That's what that's what the joke was. Shh. Um, but yeah, if you find one, it's kind of technically our jobs to find it because everybody else in the world who's following all these conspiracy theories about what's going wrong and how these leaks are finding all this information. And so far to date, I'm going to reiterate this later. So far to date, nobody has come forward to say I found this device plugged into my hardware. Albeit, somebody in China could probably say, Yeah, I bought a Cisco device and it was. Infected, just like many years ago, 
we are all complaining. Everybody in the U.S. was up in arms because they were buying Huawei routers and they were all infected. And it's like, wait, who's infecting what? We don't even know. And nobody was finding these things. And so far, I will clarify that nobody's come forth with a Cisco router or anything that's allegedly been infected with any surveillance state, not just the U.S.'s, but any surveillance state's things that, at least that none that I've seen. Perhaps they're getting taken care of before they come up forward. <laughs> Uh, that's also not a problem I address in this talk, nor, <laughs> nor take any liability for. So I'll get into the, the software exploits. Yes? So like twice. twice. <laughs> no, it's my life goal is to get locked into uh, my own suitcase in a weird, confusing way. <laughs> um, there's a, but continuing on, uh, it's not my goal. And I'm not going to make any statements like many other people have to say, if I commit suicide, it wasn't my own fault. Uh, <laughs> continuing on, though. Software exploits. Most of these software exploits are explicitly targeting so called swap or irate monk, wistful, wistful toll, or deed abounds. Um, I don't have my notes again, so I can't tell you exactly which ones they were, but they basically target things like hard drive firmwares and or uh, motherboard firmwares, things like that. What's special about software exploits, and which is what, what is quite annoying, is in all my review of this, I couldn't find any definitive way to say this is the way to know if your firmware on a physical device has been infected, aside from reflashing your device. <laughs> which, it, if you've ever reflashed a device's firmware, you'll find that it's a very slow and tedious process. And if you only reflash the device's firmware back to basically standard defaults, you don't know that anything bad happened. What you have to do instead is make a copy of the firmware on the device, which takes time, and then reflash, and then get a copy from the manufacturer that's not been tampered with, do a comparison, and you, then you can val validate if perhaps your firmware on a device has been mapped. Yes. So if they control the yeah, we could also do the theoretical dance all day long. His, his question was, what if they control the manufacturer's website where you can download copies of the firmware, and then obviously now we're just doing this dance of the back and forth. Well, we'll never know. Then we'll never know. If, if they were able to infect a major technological company in the, U, in the US or anywhere abroad, where they were able to infect every version of their firmware at all points in time, that would be a very magnificent operation that would cost a lot of money because that means that every employee at all times that ever had a chance to review the source code would o either overlook or ignore or be paid off for ign ignoring the, uh, the obvious, potentially malicious segment of the code. Mind you, let's not let's ignore the fact that CVEs get released every few months about backdoors that were intentionally installed in software, and the software isn't secure in the first place, so nobody's really reviewing it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You only need one fallible individual to recover the sort of thing after yeah. the review process. Mm. It would have to be inserted after the review process, but then if as long as they have a proper so you're saying that you need one person insert it after the review process, have it end up in their firmware. But once that person leaves, that access goes away because that extra special step in the in the release process would be gone. But again, if that person's there and they've embedded it deep down in their code, it'll just sit there. We've also seen things where you can say bugs in open source software have existed for a very long time that would be very damaging to anybody who's running that version of that open source software that had that bug introduced to it. <coughs> Uh, again, so if your BIOS or your firmware or your CF card is hacked for your device, there's reflashing the device, and there's also another system called a TPM. This is trust floor, Trusted Platform Modules. Uh, these are actually installed in laptops, uh, as, as well as some routers will include this device. This is a very interesting device. I don't have a lot of details on it, uh, but you can look it up, TPM. Uh, I, I could take a, spend a long time explaining how they work, but I have a short time today and I'm trying to cover a broader subject. TPM, though, basically is a crypto chip that is installed in line in the motherboard, and during the, proce uh, the startup process, it will actually query that crypto chip, and the crypto chip will query all the systems, e.g. the CPU, the firmware, and it will, ver it will validate everything basically using MD5, basically hashes, and saying, yep, like, this is, this is coming back with the correct responses, so nothing has been modified. Is somebody dropped their gun over there and trying to... <laughs> It's very loud. Those that aren't picking up the, uh, the audio in the, in the video recording, there's very loud noises coming from the other side of that wall. Looks like somebody's doing the dishes or... All right, they're done. But yeah, TPM is a little computer chip that, that will basically query the firmware, the, uh, the CPU and other hardware devices on, at a low level in your physical hardware, and it will validate that the, 
the devices are coming back with the correct responses to its queries. Uh, this is intentional to, kind of like a DRM system, it's intentional to, to detect if somebody's modified the hardware, e.g., you'll see it again with Xbox, PlayStation modding, these sorts of things will exist for those to make sure nobody's fucking with the physical hardware because it's an embedded system that should not be changed. Uh, you also find them on laptops and a very, very few routers, but there are a series of routers that I know have these. And as long as the firmware has not been modified, this, this chip doesn't throw any wa warnings. If it detects something has been modified, chip throws a warning during the startup process and you can address that as needed. Although again, I'm surprised your hand's not up because the first thing, <laughs> the first thing somebody would say is that they can just fuck with the TPM chip and yes, they can fuck with it, re ret retell it to new, uh, a new series of uh, hash responses that it's supposed to get on these queries and then the whole thing is kind of like a cyclical argument of, well, let's just install a TPM chip for the TPM chip and continuing on so, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, with firmware, again, it's that is you can't be certain. TPM chip does a great job on its own, a fast, a very fast job on its own. You'll be able to detect if something was improperly reflashed. Um, but reflashing them yourself, pulling a copy of the firmware, and as long as the manufacturer is not in on the take, uh, <laughs> pulling a copy of the firmware from them and doing comparisons, now you know for certain if something has happened. And again, this talk is trying to get people to think about how you would address these things. And if somebody were to come forward to say, look, I just ordered a bunch of routers from company X. I got them all and they said they were firmware version X.X .X, and I can't find any firmware versions from their corporate website that actually match this version. Now we have a better story as opposed to what would be certainly what's already been reported as a, as a story is, well, I think this could be happening. Uh, Going in briefly on the Wi-Fi devices, I, I can, uh, I'm going to go quickly through this section, but it's really entertaining. They're called Sparrow and they're called Nightstand. You can pretty much figure what they are from these pictures. Nightstand is a, appears to be a laptop in a Pelican case, and Sparrow appears to be a Wi-Fi card. Everything that was released in these, um, the Der Spiegel thing regarding uh, these, these leaks about the, basically with the Sky Mall leaks, Everything about Wi-Fi was pretty much everything you had ever seen at DEF CON or Layer One or any other, other of these other security conferences. There is nothing special about Wi-Fi hacking. And the government is simply probably just going to the conferences, figuring out what everybody else is doing and then installing a, giving it a cool name like Sparrow or Nightstand. They're, I don't know what they call Metasploit, but that'd be pretty cool. They're, little me, they're like little Metasploit install. They put it in a Pelican case, give it a cool name, $500,000 project. But finishing up kind of quickly, um, cell phone bugs. I'm actually going to check my time because I'm probably quick. 30 minutes in. Cell phone bugs, um, there's two sections of them. There's the base station bugs, which they have various names, Cyclone, Crossman, EBSR, Typho, whatever. Those are all just cell phone base station attacks, which again, like I just mentioned, if you've gone, been going to, if you've been following hacker conferences and community things, we all know, b papers have already been released on how to build your own rogue base station. And that's all these cell phone base station bugs are doing. The intelligence gathering or Genesis, Water Witch, Candy Gram, and these are all systems that basically just follow people's cell phones and or basically like a, a built-in cell phone with all the tools you'll need to do network monitoring and stuff. Kind of maybe like the Pone phone, uh, but much older. All these releases were from the 2006, 2005 era. So much older technology. It's kind of cool to think that they had it at that time, but again, it's nothing that today, current technology, we don't absolutely have. With the base stations, it's kind of very entertaining. Uh, there are, there's one way to find out if there's a rogue base station in the area. Uh, I, I, tell this, I call this program Tower Canary, Canary, Tower Canary. I haven't finished it. I just only kind of vaguely worked on it and designing it for Android, but it's a simple, simple idea, is that you go to an area and you log that area as to what cell towers you're seeing, what their signal strength is, and then you come back at a later point in time, and then you look at that area to see what cell phone towers you're seeing in the area, and if, guess what, if there's a new cell phone tower, you may or may not have the identification of a rogue base station in your area. If you seem to find that a certain cell phone tower is following you around, then you have validation that there is a rogue cell tower in your area. <laughs> It's a simple idea. There are already programs in the Android market and, and for iPhone as well. In fact, I looked it up. Uh, one of the guys who started the Android project before Google bought it actually designed as one of his first programs was a tower 
uh, cell tower uh, logging system and record recording system. All right. Oh my gosh, so many questions. But that's good. Yes, you. Better be good. Let's get two more questions. I don't know enough, but I know somebody who can answer that. <laughs> I'll go back there. I don't want to. This won't work at all. It just changes all the time. Especially when you consider femto cells. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but. I don't want it. So this thing is a self tower network isn't static. It kind of moves around. Everything is kind of erratic. But I, I kind of would want, specifically to your example, a femtocell that might pop up even if it's my neighbors. It might be a false positive. But I kind of might want to know when a femtocell is popping up in my vicinity all the time. Well, then I'll just fuel people's paranoia all the much more. <laughs> uh, yeah, this isn't. Especially, I think the best example was I, when I explained this to somebody. I'm like, yeah, it'll be cell tower program. I'll tell you when new, new towers come up, and the, their immediate response was, "Well, what if I drive down the street, like drive to work? I'm gonna, you're going to encounter like ten new cell towers probably just on your way to work if you only live five, ten miles away." Um, yeah, it's not foolproof. <laughs> it's a. Five to six at one point in time. So even my graphs are my, my bad vaporware pictures are terrible. I'll still make the program when I get around to it, just for the fun of it. Um, any more? You? No? Done? Oh, I just uh, did. I just meet your disapproval. <laughs> just give me. Just gives me a no. All right. But that's the basis idea. Uh, the other stuff with uh, the cell to cell attacks, which were called uh, intelligence genesis water witch kennygram, um, those things are actually unfortunately aren't really going to be things that you, as a uh, you know as a defense or a detection method, you're going to really be able to do a lot against because it's simply another cell device that's able to communicate either with your cell device or the towers in your area, and it's going to be able to pull data off the towers. So cellular networks are a good example to stop to explain to you that the basis idea that you are using a third party service to for communications or details, it, you need to remind yourself that that third party service can at any point in time, at least explicitly in the US, be subpoenaed or, war or have a warrant out. for. If you have a warrant out for your information, they, they can be subpoenaed for the data regarding your cell ne network calls. This isn't limited to cellular networks. Your Facebook statuses, your email, your et cetera, and so forth. Your Even your private VPS that you buy from Whatever company that sells VPS services, that company themselves can be subpoenaed and they can install a system that, well, they'll be obliged by the courts to install a system to monitor your traffic. And remember that when there is an exception of a third party between you and whatever the th theoretical surveillance state is, you have pretty much no control over what that third party does. Uh, there are some things called like a warrant canaries, things like that, where they tell you every day there is not a warrant out for your arrest. There is not a warrant requesting information about you. There is not a warrant. And then when they don't send it anymore, you go, oh, shit. Uh, those systems really in practice, nobody's, I, I'm aware of, is explicitly using them, nor would somebody, nor would I feel comfortable going to an ISP or if I were the ISP, if somebody's like, hey, can you tell me if there is or isn't, like, can you tell me every day there, there is not a warrant unless there is, and then you can not tell me? I'm like, nobody's actually going to work out that deal because that's financially not feasible. <laughs> So that's the problem there. Um, and also, so yeah, because of that third party argument, because of more than likely everything everybody in this room has done probably requires a third party for communications to, to be finalized, uh, to be terminated to, with, a, with a second party. Uh, remember OPSEC at all times? And this is simply my, my slide for a hat tip to OPSEC for anybody who's genuinely concerned about these things. I agree with all of the premises of uh, operational security, but uh, they do not fit into this talk <laughs> because this talk is about detecting them and OPSEC really is about pretty much not being detected, uh, which is good for the us end users, for those who are concerned about being spied upon. Uh, those who are concerned about doing the spying, if you're concerned if you're being spied upon, it's a different argument. And that's really what the idea is here is, is validating to show for everybody as opposed to giving mm, fluff journalism maybe. Uh, so the conclusions for this talk is, uh, I enjoy the thought experiment and the discussion that these releases 
uh, that all of these leaks that have come up this last year have uh, brought up. I'm focusing on the guy who just fell asleep. <laughs> I've enjoyed all the thought experiment and the discussion that they brought up, and it's been a great year for, for those people that are concerned about privacy. Uh, I also want to state that bugs, physical bugs are detectable, and if something is physically detectable, it is physically, you can write about it, you can give a journalistic article, like a journalist, go to a journalist, write an article, get it released, because that's much more evidence than hearsay. When I feel as if perhaps I've gone to conferences for the last 10 years and I can talk about some stuff that I saw this guy give this theoretical talk on, and I'm just going to say some surveillance state is doing it that's a lot less inclining. Uh, it gives some experiment, gives some good discussions, but it's a lot less impactful than when somebody actually comes up and says, I have this physical device, it was used on me, and this is what this was. Yes. I don't condone or nor am I liable for anybody taking <laughs> taking any uh, illegal actions and or coming forward with a surveillance state. I will state though that historically in the last 10 years there have been the, everybody likes to say there's been more whistleblowers imprisoned in the last 10 years uh, by the certain US government administration. But also remember that majority of those whistleblowers actually don't serve a very long sentence, especially in income when you compare it to uh, the last 20 years of CFAA violations where people are going to jail for many, many years, uh, the uh, majority of the whistleblowers only go to jail for a couple of years, one or two years, which is a, you can choose. You can go to jail for a few years or you can go to other countries which are perhaps enemies of the U.S. for indefinite periods of time. There's um, there's definite yeah. There's in regards to leaking information, there's a, a whole entirety argument, different argument there. But as long as you're not aware of, there's a difference between leaking information regarding to your your work, like you know, Bradley Manning, Edward Snowden, or just took the data and released the data, PowerPoints, whatever. All is bullshit, um, as opposed to releasing the data to say. I just found this device. I did not know it was associated with any specific government organizations, and I'm just kind of curious as to what the fuck is going on. Perhaps I was being spied upon by the, for all I know, the Chinese, the Russians, the Yugoslavians, I don't know, uh, the Cambodians, the Kenyans, those 419 scammers, which really trying to get into my email. Uh, you don't know if you just physically found a device and say, look, I just found this device. Uh, it could even be a corporate espionage thing. If you found a device on your physical work computer, you can e easily argue that, well, this is my worry about it, it was a competitor. And that's different than whistleblowing when it was related to you being involved with secret clearance stuff and blah, blah, and violating the trust that you were given. You got all these questions. Do you wear a tinfoil hat? I got a question for you. Um, no, I don't. I, I don't That would be the argument for operational. So yeah, I said you cannot defect or you cannot detect or defend against any state action surveillance if you live within. I'll I'll give you the breadth of saying any developed technologically developed nation. How about that? If it's U.S., if it's the U.S., if it's Russia, if it's China, who are all technologically developed and very much have strong control of their infrastructure, you're under their their control. This is alluding to my other talk about the history of privacy, where uh, I'm not trying to draw any direct connections, but Technically, in 1770s, it was a big deal when the main form of communication was being uh, easily uh, wiretapped, well, effectively wiretapped uh, back then. And uh, mail sent between the US colonies was being routed through London for no clear reason, except for, well, obviously what was happening. And when they found that out, it turns out the one of the original amendments, I think it's, shoot, I don't know it. It's been like 10 to 20th amendment, I think 14th or 16th amendment was the amendment regarding federal, it is a federal crime to tamper with somebody's mail. That's why that actually exists, is that was Ben Franklin, who, who was the US postmaster at that time. Long history and story. If I have time, I can do that talk too, but I won't. <laughs> Any uh, further questions? Um, here's some further reading and resources. Michael Osman is the guy who built the Hack RF board. It's a great resource. He does a lot of open source firmware, a lot of open source hardware. Actually, sorry, it's all open source hardware. Uh, Bruce Schneier, obviously, is a good, you know, again, a hat tip towards him. Uh, I mentioned 
OPSEC, and I forgot to mention on this list, but the Grug Q or whatever, how to spell his name, how to pronounce. Does anybody know how to pronounce that name? I'll give you extra credit. Grug, Grug just Grug. There's a Q. The Q is silent. Um, and then, of course, the leak source files at WordPress.com is actually the, the most definitive source for the SkyMall leaks that I found. Again, it seems like most of the leaks were referencing their leak, but no determination as to the origin of the source of those leaks from which intelligence agency or which source that came from from there on out. This is Privacy Tech Journal, which is some bullshit site where I talk. And uh, again, again, harass me on Twitter or you can find me around here for the weekend. Um, tomorrow night, also post layer one, there will be the uh, barbecue, which is frankly my fault and my, my problem. So I'll be cooking some delicious smoked meat and some smoked vegetables for everybody to enjoy. So come find me if you want to go to that. Thank you. Where's Datagram? I don't know how to leave the stage.